I'm just going to touch on a couple um, diseases that we see in horses that um, are um, related to digestive um, incidences. First, we'll start with colic. Um, it is the number one killer of horses. I don't know if a lot of people realize that, but most cases of colic are mild and resolve with simple medical treatment. Um, it does say um, that you should get your colics treated right away, but I see a lot of people that um, give it a little bit of time, um, and a lot of these will just resolve on their own um, if they're just a spasmodic colic. It's not a disease, it is merely a symptom of a disease. Um, it is a term that just means belly ache, just like a colic in a child. Um, abdominal pain that can come from any abdominal organ and not just a GI abnormality. Recognizing colic, the symptoms, um, probably absence of appetite is the number one we see that most people recognize that their horse isn't eating their hay in the morning or grain. Um, we do see them lie down turn their head toward the flank like they're biting at their sides, um, pawing, kicking or biting at belly, repeated rolling, which means it's getting a lot worse if we're getting to that point, um, sitting in a dog-like position, stretching out and posturing to urinate. Um, I get a lot of calls that say my horse can't urinate, something's wrong, when often that is a sign of colic. Uh, also holding head in an unusual position, lack of bowel movement, um, we don't really uh, worry too much um, if they haven't gone to the bathroom in uh, a certain amount of time, depending on how much they've eaten, of course, but um, certainly if they're um, posturing like they're trying to defecate and it's not coming out, that's not good. Reduced or absent digestive signs and inappropriate sweating. We see a lot of uh, rapid breathing or flared nostrils. You can evaluate their pulse rate um, just by listening to their heart rate usually is the best thing. And if they're greater than 50 beats per minute, it's a sound, sign of pain. Uh, depression and lip curling unrelated to sexual interest, that's phlegmon when they put their lip up and um, act like uh, something's wrong. Um, a lot of times that's a sign of colic. You want to call your veterinarian, um, remove all food from the horse, but water is fine. They usually won't go to water unless uh, they are feeling much better, so it, it's also a sign of progression. Um, you want to keep the horse in a confined area where it can be watched. One reason is to see if it does defecate. That's a good sign. Allow rest or walk the horse around if it is continually rolling or in danger of hurting itself. Um, I recommend walking if you're not going to exhaust the horse. Don't do it for hours and make them really tired. That's not going to help the digestive system. And always continue to observe. Some things you can get on your own um, that will help the veterinarian decide if it is a time that they need to get out there. Um, if they've had um, signs of colic and the severity, just the kicking and the biting and those kind of signs. Pulse or heart rate, respiratory rate, rectal temperature. Typically, uh, we don't see a fever in colic. So if they're running a fever, it may be something else that you're dealing with. Uh, color of the gums and moistness of gums. Here you can see a couple. These are not good gum quality. The bottom one is definitely um, very yellow. Um, there's no pink quality. But we want to see a capillary refill of uh, one to two seconds. Um, if you do have a stethoscope or even just putting your ear to the horse, you want to hear digestive sounds, that's good. That's a sign of a spasmodic colic, which is the kind that resolve on their own usually. Um, bowel movements. Recent change in diet or exercise, uh, those are big ones and have the relation to the feed that we're going to talk about. And of course, medical history, if it's had a colic surgery before, or colic in the past. Um, when the veterinarian comes out, they're going to ask um, lots of questions about the history. Have you just dewormed? Um, have you vaccinated recently that might affect the, the gut? Um, review of your observations and then our observations. We might do a rectal palpation. We can feel twists um, through the rectum. Uh, there's not a lot you can feel back there, but gas. Um, 
vital signs and intestinal sign sounds. Uh, passage of a nasogastric tube is done often when we think it's an impaction, when there's too much feed just stopped in there. Um, you put uh, um, mineral oil in there, and a lot of times that'll help things move through. Um, I don't typically pass a stomach tube on a spasmodic colic. Um, a twist is usually a medical condition, but it can help if it's partial. Uh, we might take some abdominal fluid. That's going to teach us, a, uh, tell us a couple things. Um, one, if it's leaking um, abdominal fluid into the abdominal cavity, that's not a good sign. Um, sometimes you can get feed. That's not a good sign. Um, sometimes just bloody discharge. Uh, some blood tests, a lot of times that doesn't come fast enough, so it's not done um, in time to, when we choose to get the animal to surgery if need be. Uh, response to treatment, if we put oil in there. Um, there's a couple antispasmodic chemicals that we use IV now that will help us um, stop a spasmodic colic, and if they respond to that, that's a good thing. Uh, some people do ultrasounds. There are certain places you can see with the ultrasound that can show you if there is a twist. Um, these are just some of the, you can see the size of the um, digestive tract in a horse and uh, what can happen to it. Uh, different classifications. I talked about impaction a little bit. When, we, um, when I worked in Nebraska, I saw a lot of impactions because people would put their um, horses on corn stalks. Uh, they don't digest corn stalks very well. <laughs> and uh, it would get impacted in there and uh, all packed up and the mineral oil that we put in there often would help move things through. Um, this one, in the intestinal dysfunction includes uh, spasms, gas distension, impaction, and decreased motility. It's probably the most common, I'd say 65% of the colics that we see are in this classification. Uh, intestinal accidents. Older horses get um, fecal or not fecal fat balls um, that hang inside the digestive tract or outside the digestive tract actually and flip around and cause um, the digestive material not to be passed on. Um, there's also emboli and clots um, and infarctions. Restricted blood flow in any way is going to cause the digestive system to die in a certain area. And uh, these are not good um, and require surgery to fix. They'll usually take out a portion of the digestive system. And then there's the ulcers. I think you've probably heard um, a lot about ulcerations in the stomach of horses in recent years. They've come up with it's very common, especially horses that are used for um, show and uh, get transported around a lot. They are um, creating gastric ulcers. Um, they respond pretty well to treatment. They often colic m more frequently than other types of colic, um, and they do pretty well with medication. Treatment, um, we give them pain relievers. You have to be careful. Um, banamine is probably the most common pain reliever we use, and everybody says give a colic. Vanamine, but you will mask the symptoms. We want to know how painful they are. Um, so I don't jump to banamine unless you can't get a veterinarian there and it's mild and you want them to um, calm down a little bit if they're starting to roll and stuff. Fluid therapy often is the medical choice uh, when they're not going to surgery. Uh, nasogastric roots or the mineral oil is what we put down there usually. Tranquilizers to um, relieve them of pain and just to quiet them down if they're rolling and we don't want them to hurt themselves and of course surgery. Preventing colic, this is the important thing and how it relates to your forage. Um, routine, routine, routine is really good for horses. They are definitely animals that uh, like a set schedule. Even changing your time of the day that you feed can uh, change their gut routine and uh, cause them to colic. Roughage is extremely important. Um, horses can't survive on grain alone. Um, there are grains that are um, mixed with forage. 
and are pretty good. I know people take those hunting and stuff and that's okay, but you have to be careful if they've been on pasture and they're used to forage and then you bring them to an area um, where you're just feeding um, a high um, concentration ration like grain, you can easily cause them to colic because of the microbes in their belly. They don't uh, digest like ruminants do. They are not a ruminant. Um, limit the amount of grain-based feeds. Um, I would say horses, unless they're performing or underweight, some of our older generation definitely need um, some concentration, but most horses do not need a concentration ration. Establish a parasite control program. Parasites definitely can cause colic. And exercise or daily turnout is really important. Proper dinner care has um, grown in the last few years. Um, we see a lot of horses living into their 30-year uh, life and uh, proper dental care is really important then and don't start when they're 30, start when they're younger because preventing cracked teeth and missing teeth or teeth growing into the space where a tooth is missing is really important and you'll have a very thin horse if you don't. Um, gradual changes in diet, clean water, certain medications can cause uh, a colic, but not very many. Uh, check your hay, and we don't see too much um, sand colic out here. Our soil is just not sandy, but in California and some other places, they do have a high rate of sand colic, and we use some psyllium to push stuff through, but that's not a big cause. Um, problem out here. Reduce stress. Pay attention to animals when transporting. Uh, you might want to think about bringing your own water that they're used to in your own feed. Of course, foaling mares. Um, previous bouts of colic, they aren't necessarily more likely to do it, but if there's a reason like ulceration in their stomach, they could do it again, and we want to prevent that. Um, maintain accurate records. Good management, um, identify the problem early and uh, treat it as potentially serious. I think we head off a lot of colics but just because people have us um, treat them early and they don't get into a point where they need some surgery. Okay. Now we're gonna just touch base on laminitis, another um, forage-based problem. Um, laminitis is um, a big problem. Um, it's very preventable in a lot of cases, um, and I'm sure you've heard, heard before killing our horses with kindness by overfeeding them or giving them too much pasture. Uh, some horses are more susceptible than others. Um, probably the most common cause of laminitis is overfeeding, um, and it's in our control. It's uh, disruption, chronic or intermittent, of blood flow to the sensitive and insensitive lamina, which um, the lamina structures are within the foot and secure the coffin bone to the hoof wall. There's a picture here. Inflammation leads to scar tissue formation, and that can weaken the lamina and interfere with wall and hoof wall bond. It's, it's very confusing. <laughs> um, that the digestive system of the horse is affecting the feet of the horse, but it's all through the blood flow, whether it be toxins, uh, a lot of carbohydrates. And we are looking at um, just the very front right here where the, the wall of the um, hoof wall attaches to the lamina and keeps it. I mean, that foot is suspended in there. It's not set up on the sole, it would come through the sole. It's actually suspended by a bond in there. Uh, you may have heard of founder, which is basically the same thing. Um, they like to say founder is more the chronic or long-term um, condition. Acute laminitis is usually the first 72 hours, the most painful part. After that, they consider it chronic. Um, can affect all four feet 
but most likely is in the front two feet. Um, once in a while, we'll get one foot worse than another. If you block that foot or make it numb, then you will see it come out and the other foot is just not as strong. Um, in severe cases, the bone in the hoof wall can separate that bond in there. Um, the coffin bone may rotate within the foot, come forward and actually sink. The bone sinks lower than where it was set to begin with and rotates. Um, these are changes that they call founder. Uh, that's pretty severe, but I'm sure you've seen some feet that have that wavy characteristic and almost look club-footed and they're real sore on them. And that's what's happening. Um, it is still unknown exactly what's happening in the foot. Um, we know per certain events can precipitate it. Um, although it's in the feet, again, it's caused by the digestive system for the most part. Certain causes are digestive upsets, such as overload of grain. Um, lush forage, that's probably one of the most common ones out here because we flood irrigate. Um, where you have flood irrigation, you have a lot of carbohydrates coming into that forage at a very short time and their stomachs don't have time to um, change over and adjust to it. And we create a lot of um, bugs, microbes in the system that are not good for the feet. Um, we call this grass founder. Toxins released by the horse's system, that's again can come from bacteria dying in the digestive system and they release toxins. We see it some with a high fever illness, uh, Potomac horse fever, which we don't have around here. Some colic or diarrhea, salmonella, um, and then retain placenta in the mare after foaling. That's one incidence where you need to be right on top of um, a mare that's foaled that they can't retain their placenta like a cow can and walk around for a couple days with it in them, they're gonna get really sick. Uh, road founder, supporting limb laminitis. I'm sure most of you know who Barbaro was and that's basically what happened to him is he couldn't stand on his broken leg for so long that he foundered or got laminitis in the opposite front leg and that hoof um, bone went through the bottom of his foot. Um, black walnut shavings, which are hard to find anymore, I think, because of the problems that they create. Um, and steroids, which most vets are very careful about, but certainly good for you to know not to put a lot of steroids in your horse. Um, heavy breeds, such as draft breeds, um, probably endocrine diseases is one of the biggest causes we see um, in older horses. It would be called Cushing's. Um, and they usually are overweight, long hair coat, and a crusty neck. They are very prone to laminitis. We don't know exactly why, except for they produce a lot of cortisol. There's a problem between their pituitary and their adrenal glands, um, so that they're circulating a lot of cortisol. There are medications for it, and that work really well. But we see that as horses get older, it's just a natural disease occurrence that happens. Uh, large amounts of carbohydrates. Ponies, Morgans, donkeys, and miniature horses are very susceptible. Um, you want to get your vet on board right away. It's very painful and pro progress. Um, there's the Cushing's disease in older horses. That's typically what they look like. That horse does not have a crusty neck, but it has hirsutism or um, excess hair growth. Um, they're very lame. Shifting leg lameness, pain in the toe region, digital pulses, which are hard to find. This is the stance that they get in. Um, walking on eggshells or a sawhorse stance, they, they put all their weight on their back legs and they don't want to step on their front legs. Um, you can see in chronic laminitis that they have hoof wall rings um, that aren't growing correctly and a, a widened white line, which is the very front. That's where the attachment is at the very <coughs> bottom of the hoof wall. Um, that is a typical Cushing's horse, the crusty neck, big belly. They have fat pads on them, and they are very likely to develop laminitis, although not all of them do. Um, obesity is definitely a problem. 
There's not a lot of things you can do for it. Um, we put their ice their feet. I put them in a creek out here. We got plenty of cold water. Um, we use um, drugs. Uh, we want to get them off the high forage if they're uh, in the pasture. Um, only grass hay, dried grass hay. Um, we will, if they have gotten into a grain overload, then we will treat them for that with mineral oil. Um, Painkillers, anti-inflammatories like DMSO are common. Um, antibiotics, because they tend to develop um, abscesses in their feet. It's a very ongoing problem as that foot grows out. It takes about a year to grow out a foot um, from a laminitis bout, and you'll see that line or the ridge grow down. Um, corticosteroids, again, are inadvisable and long-term. Um, sand is wonderful. They find their um, most comfortable position, which is usually with their heels up, to take some of the weight off the pull of their tendons. Um, but a lot of times we'll put them in a sand or dirt run where they're more comfortable. Abscesses have to be treated, and we do have special shoes now that help a lot with uh, corrective shoeing and trimming um, that put them in a better position. But it is, it's, it's, you don't want your horse to go through laminitis if you can help it. Um, Keep your, just consider um, forage that if you're flood irrigating, the horse needs to get on the pasture slowly, a couple hours a day um, into four hours a day into six hours a day. It's a slow process to change the microbes in their digestive system. It does take a year to grow out typically. Um, some will have a one-time bout and we catch it and we treat it and they do fine. And some, um, it's an ongoing problem, although with shoeing they can be okay and some unfortunately don't make it through it at all. Uh, we do do x-rays. Um, I didn't put any x-rays in here. They can show you, I think, yeah. That one is pretty severe. Um, you can see the front of the hoof where the white line is, and that black that's underneath that is air. That's a separation of the hoof wall and the bone, and air has gotten up in there, which is going to abscess as it grows down. That bone is basically coming out the bottom of the foot. Um, that little pin at the bottom is just showing where the tip of the frog is. Um, and it's a tack. Um, so that is the bottom of the foot, and you can see where the point of the bone is, is coming through. Um, we take radiographs typically um, at the beginning to make sure there isn't a rotation. If there is, we need to get support on the frog um, and put those special shoes, and it's expensive. Um, and it's a, kind of a nightmare to deal with feeding a horse. Um, it's the same for a colicky horse that's collect a lot. Um, you have to feed them multiple times a day in small amounts. They can't be pigs about their eating and out on a lot of pasture. Um, so it, it's, it's much easier to prevent it than treat it. Um, it is more likely to recur once it's had it. Um, this is what I was talking about with the diet and uh, dealing with um, a certain kind of diet, um, low in carbohydrates is best for them. Routine hoof care is very important. Long hooves pull on the front of that lamina and cause more pain in those horses that have scar tissue in there. So a good health maintenance schedule that includes parasite control and vaccination is really important. Um, management, you just want to avoid grazing, overgrazing, lush pastures. Um, these times, I think, correspond with the last lecture. Late morning and late afternoon hours are when their sugars are at the highest. There's a lot of debate over when to put your horse out when, if you want to graze them 12 hours out of the day, but I think overnight is the best. Um, spring season is probably the worst, although we see problems in the um, fall when the grasses are starting to store up for winter. So it's not just a spring problem. It happens in the fall, too, quite a bit when people are 
letting them eat because they think there's nothing left in the grass. Uh, prevent it is your best bet. Um, and keep your, if you think you have a horse that's got a crusty neck and is overweight and it could be a problem, I would get the veterinarian out there and get, get you talking about a nutritional program to get that down. Um, we always are careful with horses that are um, sick and run a fever. We give them um, banamine as an anti-endotoxin so those toxins don't go down to the feet and cause a problem. Um, but it is not something you want to deal with if you can help it. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. I don't have a question so much as most all of this horse problem is people's related. Yes. They just like Eric said, they throw two times, one morning, one in the evening, to their horses. Well, the horses, they get colic from that because they're just wolfing it down, so they're not naturally grazing like they should be. Right. And then all they overfeed with grain because they're being nice to their horse. That's the killing with kindness. <laughs> um, and I think we have to be very um, cognizant of um, flood irrigating. That's where I see, I see the um, river valleys where there's lush pasture and people just let them graze. I mean, a horse should be able to graze, but not when it's gaining lots of weight and it doesn't get enough exercise. If you exercise a horse enough, maybe they can do that. But there are definitely, as you saw, um, certain breeds that are worse than others that you have to be careful of. The Morgan breed is one of the worst. Miniature horses are pretty bad. Um, and they have a certain look to them that um, you can tell it's coming on. Um, certainly a grain overload if they get into the grain bin is something that you just need to treat right away. Um, but the other ones can happen somewhat gradually within. I, I've seen um, lush pasture overload happen in two to three days. So, um, but it is, um, you have to be very careful with grain, with horses. They are not supposed to be animals that get into a lot of carbohydrates. They're more of a forage animal. One other thing that's a pet peeve for me with, there are probably horse people in here, but it's something, your horse needs exercise. Like Eric said, they're travel. I didn't know they traveled that much, but my horses are constantly going out. They'll nap, they'll eat. They're coming back to water, they're going out, yeah. they're going someplace else. And so they're getting exercise. You do the same thing with a person who sits in front of the TV and just goes <laughs> to the refrigerator once in a while. And they're going to founder. They're going to founder the same thing. So your horses need exercise and not locked up. Yeah. Now I've seen horses rolling. Uh, just go out the pasture, lay down, you know, roll over. Is that? That's natural. Okay. Um, That's what I thought most of the time they will get right up or yeah. sit in a sternal position with their legs tucked underneath them. Um, sitting sternal, most of the horses that are colicking, when they roll, they'll lay out and they'll kick at their belly. I mean, it's, it's kind of a combination of signs rather than just one. But horses do roll naturally. Sometimes they'll try to roll over and they can't get over and then they just usually stand up and that's fine. Yeah. Right. Up and down, a lot of that. Yeah. Not usually. No. I was just wondering when when is like the spring danger over on irrigated pasture? Like it's a good question. Grass, yeah, um, it's when. Um, well, some people wait until they turn off the water, until um, you don't have the irrigation there. Um, but most of the time, we hit June. We're doing pretty well, and you're dropping in your. I think we saw that with the last lecture too, um, in the forage amounts, the carbohydrates drop a lot in June and July. Um, but I, again, fall is definitely a problem that I think a lot of people aren't ready for.